Well, we are in our series that is Feast on This Book, which is an exciting series about how we read the Bible and feast on the Word of God and the goodness of what God is saying to us in His Bible. And uh, this morning, the title of my message is The Bible Feast. You might get a little bit hungry during this message because I'm talking about food. So make sure you still listen, even if your lips are... What's that word? Salivating. Is that the right word? Yep. Thank you. Luke's nodding his head. Uh, And uh, it is going to be a great morning. And I hope that some of the things that have been keys for me to read the Bible are empowering you and your family to read the Bible and to feast on his word. And firstly, we're going to start with bread. Start small. I don't know about you, but I really like garlic bread. And the key to a great feast is an entree. And I don't know about you, but I reckon it's garlic bread. Sometimes cheesy garlic bread. Oh, there we go. Now now we're talking. Uh, I have a group of friends and we actually have a chat that's called No Bread. Because we would find that every time, which was almost weekly and almost included trivia, every week we would have dinner together and nearly every week, pretty much every week, we would be having garlic bread and then we'd have dinner and then we'd have a dessert afterwards and we were finding that we, like, this is probably not the best for our body to be eating so much bread all the time. So we thought, you know, let's start small, let's start somewhere and we're going to go no more bread when we gather together except for on special occasions. When we're feasting, we're going to have bread. And um, so we cut out bread so that it was better for our bodies. We started small. I know you might be thinking, man, that was, that's an easy thing. But you should start small. When you're looking after your body and your spiritual body and you're reading the Bible, I want to encourage you, if you have a struggling to start somewhere, start small. Uh, Zechariah 4, 9 to 10 says, Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Now, in those days in the Old Testament, uh, the temple was the place where people could experience and meet God. And now when Jesus came, there was a new covenant and uh, our bodies became the temple of the Holy Spirit and we could meet with God and speak with God without having to go to the temple. And it says in 1 Corinthians uh, six nineteen to 20, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with his high price with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our temple, our body is the temple of God. And when we start small, when we feast on the word of God, we are building the body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so when I I I am not a great reader, I would say, and I actually don't like reading. Ooh. Uh, and pretty much the only book I do read is the Bible, Uh, but I found it hard to just start. I found it hard to just get in a rhythm of starting with something, and I've got a photo on the screen. Don't uh, look at the three and a half thousand unread emails, Um, but look at the top. So what I did was I started small, and I went, I'm going to put the verse of the day on my phone so that when I open my phone of a morning... I've got it right there and I can read the Bible straight away. Start small, start somewhere. You know, it said uh, in Zechariah, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Don't despise the small beginnings of reading his word. Start small, start with bread. Now we've had entree, we've had some bread. Now we move on to the main course. Now, some people would be like, oh, what's, what's the best thing about feasting in a main course? Well, uh, my next point is three greens on your plate. It's all about consistency. When you look after, I know some people are shaking their head like three greens. This is another thing that's been hard for me to <laughs> build into my lifestyle. I'm not the best cook. Uh, but this is something that I have been doing uh, over the last, uh, well, last 
three months this year. I, a New Year's resolution was to change my life uh, completely. Um, but I went, you know what, I'm going to try and build consistency each week, making sure that I have three greens on the plate. And um, the same is when we, that's looking after our body, right? Which again is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the same is for when we read the Bible. We need consistency in our Bible reading. One Corinthians fifteen fifty eight says, "So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless." When we are consistent in reading our Bible, it is building our body, building our temple, building our relationship with God. And we need to build consistency in that. And this year, I again bit of a confession time. I'm not, I said, I'm not the best reader. Um, but this year, I have been very consistent in my Bible reading. I think I have missed maybe one or two days this year so far. And my goal from the previous years and over the last few years has been to read the Bible more than I did last year. Um, and this year, I have set some consistency. And when I was thinking about this the other day as I was preparing for this uh, message, I was thinking about my last job and I was helping people, I started to help people with addictions and they would talk about triggers that would be leaders to the bad habit or the addiction and to change the trigger to then get away from that bad habit. And I thought, you know what, I need a trigger in my life that leads to reading the Bible consistency, consistently. And so um, I've embarked on a journey of going to the gym a lot of times this year. Uh, I went all, every day in February. Thank you. Uh, you can clap now. Um, but that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. The point is that that was my trigger to reading the Bible. So I would walk to the gym. I'd put headphones in, have my phone. And I'd listen to the Bible as well as be reading it as I was on my way to the gym. Also, the other trigger was if I was in the car for a long period of time as the first thing in the morning, I'd put the Bible on and be listening to it. Find something that helps you to build consistency in reading the Word of God. Just like we need to have three greens in our meal, we need to build consistency around reading the Bible. Whether that's as a family around the dinner table using the bite-sized Bible that you've been given. Hashtag, if you haven't got one, go to the next step stand for your family uh, to get one. Around the dinner table, be reading the Bible together, whether it's as soon as you wake up, you look at it on your phone and you've got a reminder there to read the Bible. Whatever that trigger is for you that helps you to build that consistency in your life. Now, we've had the entree. We've got the greens on the plate. What about the protein? Max is like, come on, give me some protein. 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 Build in this. Protein, if you don't know, when you work out, apparently, I've been told. Um, when you work out and you have, you have a window of time after you work out to eat some protein or have some protein for it to build your muscles. Now, when we read the Bible, we should be building our muscles in community. When we read the Bible and consume protein, the way that we build and flex our muscles is we read it in community. We read it together. We discuss it. We encourage each other with it. We make sure that we're not just reading it alone in our own, through our own eyes, but we re also read it with others to get their point of view and to be able to discuss it and to be able to flex those muscles and to build those muscles. If you just go to the gym, yeah, your muscles might get a little bit bigger, but, or if you just eat protein, your muscles might get a little bit bigger. But when you put the two together, reading the Bible and community together, you're actually going to flex those muscles and you're going to be building the body that is the temple of the Holy Spirit in a better way. You're going to be building better spiritual muscles. Genesis 9.3 says, and this is the best steak you can have. I don't know about you. I grew up on with a family that I actually refused to eat steak in my family because my parents would buy the cheapest steak in the world and it would be so thin and then they'd cook it till it was black 
and it was burnt and it was disgusting. So I hated eating steak as a, as a child. So now uh, when I want steak, I go to a restaurant and make sure it's been cooked properly. Uh, it is expensive, but, you know, it is good to eat steak. But that, that steak is nothing in comparison to the Word of God, to the Word of God and what He says to us. Genesis 9.3 says, Every moving thing that liveth in shall be meat for you, even as the green herb I have given you all things. This is living. This is meat for you. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible is meat. It is protein, but we must consume it in community together to flex those muscles, to build those muscles together. I'm going to invite the team back up. So we've had, we've got the greens, we've got the protein on the plate, we've had our bread. Now, some people would argue that the sauce is the most important part to a meal. Mmm, mmm, aioli, gravy, mint sauce, sweet chilli, supercharged KFC, supercharged KFC sauce. Don't forget the sauce. I was in a um, cafe on Monday morning preparing for my message and I ordered some food and the waiter who actually turned out to be the owner of the cafe and also is a Christian, uh, checked out their website, they're a Christian um, cafe which is pretty cool. He was like, you should try this sauce, really try I was like, can I have some barbecue sauce and some mayo on the side and with the tomato chutney? I'll have all types of sauce. Not the point of my message, right? Um, And he's like, no, no, no. Why don't you try this sauce? It's our special sauce. It's amazing. And he was so enthusiastic about it. And I was like, sure, let's give it a try. It was actually really good. And when we read the Bible, we need to remember and reflect on the best source of all, which is Jesus need to read the Bible with a relationship with Jesus. Otherwise, it's just a book. It's just a book of stories. It's the best-selling book in the world. But unless we read it with the source, with Jesus, with a relationship with Him, we're just reading words on the page. It starts with a relationship with Jesus. John 1, 1 1-4 says, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was God, and the Word was God. He, he existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. Brings life and light to our lives. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong in all our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. The Bible points to Jesus points to a relationship with Him. Throughout the whole of the Scriptures, it is talking about and pointing to Jesus. Even in the Old Testament, Adam, as the first man, he represents humanity's fall, while Christ is the last Adam who brings redemption. Abel, his righteousness sacrifice, righteous sacrifice, points to Christ's ultimate sacrifice. Noah, just as Noah's ark saved his family, Christ's work saves his people. Isaac, his near sacrifice by Abraham foreshadows God's sacrifice of his son. Jesus betrayed by, uh, sorry, Joseph betrayed by his brothers. He becomes a saviour figure similar to Christ. Moses, as a deliverer of Israel, he typifies Christ, the ultimate deliverer. Samson, his strength and final act of sacrifice point to Christ's powerful redemption. 
Jonah, his three days in the fish um, prefigure Christ's death and resurrection. You know, these figures and symbols are woven throughout the Old Testament, each contributing to a greater understanding of Christ's role and work in the New Testament. It all points to Jesus. And when we feast on this book, we need to do it with a relationship with Jesus, the best source of all. You can ask for every head to be bowed, every eye to be closed in this room right now. And if you're just reading this, you've been reading the Bible just as a, a book without a relationship with Jesus, without a, a connection with the true author of this word, I want to encourage you this morning that the best thing you can do is to partner your life with His, to say yes to Him for the first time, to allow Him to speak these words to you through a relationship with Him. And if you want to do that this morning, I want to encourage you to place your hand up nice and high so I can see it. We're going to pray a prayer together to cement this moment. So if that's you this morning, place your hand up nice and high. Church, let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. And fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, when we have Jesus by our side, you can open your eyes and lift your heads, by the way. If you want, you don't have to, if you don't want to. When we have Jesus by our side, you know, he died on that cross for us, but he also left us a great comforter, a great guider. He left us the Holy Spirit, which leaves me to my next point, which is always leave room for dessert. I think the best part of a feast, apart from the sauce, is a good dessert. You know, Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we read His Word as we read the Word of God to empower us, to encourage us, to speak to us, to bring these words to life. John 14, 25 to 26 says, I am telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. John 16, 8 to 9 says, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Now, when we believe in Jesus, when we partner our life with him, he gives us the Holy Spirit to breathe life into these words, to bring to life what he is saying to you through his word. And I want to encourage you as you read the Bible, as you feast on the Word of God, to allow His Holy Spirit to breathe. His Holy Spirit to speak to you. For His Holy Spirit to bring those words to life. We're going to do that. Now I'm going to ask for everyone to stand for a moment. Our team are going to beautifully play behind us. And I'm going to just speak some Bible verses over you this morning. And I just want to encourage you to open up your heart to what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you this morning. Through this, the Bible, the Word of God. Esther 4.14 says, I was made for such a time as this. You know, you're not a mistake you're here for a reason. 
Proverbs 31, 25 says, I am clothed with strength and dignity and I can laugh at the days to come. I am clothed with strength and dignity and I can laugh at the days to come. No matter what wall that you feel is in front of you, no matter what your circumstance is, God's got the future in control. You can laugh at the days to come. Psalm 139, 14 says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Doesn't matter what the world says about me. I am wonderfully made in the eyes of God. 2 Timothy 1, 7, the Spirit... God gave me, does not make me timid, but gives me power, love, and a sound mind. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, it's His strength that gives us the power to move through circumstances. 3 John 1.2, I will be in good health even as my soul prospers. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Ephesians 2.10, I was created in Christ Jesus to do good work, works that God prepared in advance for me to do. You know what? Your future is not a mistake by God. Your future is in His hands. Your future has been planned out by God. 1 Corinthians 6.19, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Come on, the Holy Spirit has been given to us to empower us to live in our body. Colossians 3.12, I am chosen, holy and dearly loved. You know, you're chosen. You're a child of God. Luke 10.19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread, tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. You know, he's given you authority to speak to the enemy and say, no more. Lord, as we meditate on those words of of the Bible, of your words, Lord, I just pray right now that you would let them sink into our soul. Lord, that you would speak to us this morning, that you would speak to us in our heart. Lord, allow our heart to be open to you this morning. Allow our mind to be open to focus on you this morning. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you would move in this place right now.